Knicks Fan TV, the podcast. Salute to Knicks Nation out there as we are getting ready to be in the thick of the Knicks offseason with free agency right around the corner. I wanted to revisit the R.J. Barrett topic one last time. I told you guys that I was looking to get a NBA scout on, someone who uh, breaks down film and can give us a bit more insight into R.J.'s game. So joining us tonight... He is the former video coordinator of the Washington Wizards. He also served as an advanced scout for the uh, Toronto Raptors and Atlanta Hawks. That is Brian Olringer. Brian, how are you doing tonight, man? I'm good. How are you? Doing pretty good. Doing pretty good. I think the fan base has been galvanized by, by the R.J. Barrett pick. I think they're optimistic about it. So tonight, I wanted to get... I know you had done uh, quite a few breakdowns on R.J.'s game. So I kind of wanted to start with, uh, in terms of his strengths, you know, what do you see as some things that RJ can do to help the Knicks right now? I think he has a, a really good feel for the game. Um, you know, I think he kind of uh, is a guard who can play a little of that point forward and, and be a secondary ball handler uh, within the offense. He could run some pick and roll for him. I think he's a, a good passer with good floor vision. Um, you know, and that's something... Knox kind of lacks, um, so I think it's a good uh, potential compliment in that way. And I also think, you know, it also stands out that he just seems to has, have a really good motor and uh, be able to play really hard for, for long lengths of time. I think he was top five in the NCAA in, in minutes played, and it seemed like Coach K played him, you know, almost 38 minutes uh, pretty much every game. Um, so that kind of just speaks volumes to me in that, you know, I think he's a guy who was really trusted and can, you know, switch one through four and, and be a physical uh, good defender in today's NBA, and so yeah, I think he has a lot of a lot of positives and a lot of upside that'll definitely be able to help the Knicks next season. Yeah, I, I mean, you, you know, you mentioned the playmaking, and, and I think that's one area clearly uh, that we've been sorely missing. We we've yet to really establish anyone at the point guard spot. The pick and roll uh, execution, especially off the lobs, was was very inconsistent. I think we saw a little bit of it coming. Uh, to the close of the season, you know, guys start, starting to find Mitchell Robinson a bit better on on the lob. So I think from a playmaking standpoint, uh, you know, having RJ in that role could could certainly help. Yeah, I think uh, you know that's his. I've I've kind of likened him a little bit to the way you know a guy like Joe Ingles plays uh, with Utah. You know, I know he's kind of a unathletic guy, and you know, it's it, it's not you don't want that to be your ceiling. But uh, I think Ingles plays you know with a really good pace to his game reads the floor really really well and I, I think that's kind of where you see the RJ uh Steve Nash influence and I think he really you know had a, had a couple uh double digit assist games which is pretty unusual for a guy who's who's not a point guard and is more of a of a scoring wing so I think he's a he's a pretty underrated passer and I think he'll uh you know fit in well whether it be uh Dennis Smith Jr. Or whoever exactly the point guard is I think he's a guy who can you know, run some stuff for him as, as a secondary ball handler. Yeah, you, you, you mentioned the high assist numbers, and I think we, we certainly saw that when, especially when Zion went down. We, we saw a lot of RJ playing a bit of the one, um, running the offense and, and facilitating, especially um, once we got into the conference tournament stage. Definitely saw the ball in his hands uh, in, a lot. Um, how about his shooting? You know, from a shooting standpoint, you know, only shooting 31% from three um, how, how do you, how do you see him as a, as a shooter coming into the next level? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, not perfect. I, I think it'll take some time, but I, I think he can become a pretty capable, uh, you know, NBA three point shooter. I, I think, you know, what, what stands out with him is, uh, the upper body is usually really good. You know, his, his hands, his ball placement, his follow through, all that looks good. I think it's just sometimes the, the lower body, the, the footwork, um, you know, being straight up, straight down, those things are not as consistent. But I think that's something they can uh, they can clean up and they can you know do a lot of work on. And I, I don't think he'll be uh, you know an elite three point shooter at least for the first year or two. But I think he does have really good touch and, and good form generally. Like I said, that he should be able to shoot it pretty well. Yeah, I mean that's something that I, I noticed in, in watching his games this season is that you know he does have a good touch, but you you did see a lot of forced shots um in, in a lot of games i think the tar hills game really stuck out to me um later on in, in that season it, it does take a lot of forced jumpers which which could be a bit concerning 
Yeah, I, I the one thing I, I guess on on the negative side, you know, the like I said, beyond just uh, the fundamental issues with his shot in terms of the footwork, he, he really doesn't have that uh, mid level uh, scoring capability, and that is you know one of the fair knocks I think on him and, and why. You know, to be honest, personally, I, I prefer Jared Culver uh, as a prospect just because I think he's a guy who's going to be an elite scorer at all three levels, you know, at the rim, in mid-range, and, and from three. And I think right now, RJ, you know, will learn to shoot the three fine, and I, I think his percentage was, you know, a little lower than uh, than really his form would indicate um, in college. I, I think he, he'll get to the basket okay and, and finishes really well, definitely going to his left hand. Um, you know, but you don't see as much of that creativity, that ability to get his shot off uh, off the bounce, uh, you know, to be kind of an ISO scorer. So whether that's within his game, you know, maybe is a possibility. Maybe Duke just didn't really cultivate that a whole lot yet. But uh, I did feel like, for example, Culver was a guy who could kind of get his own shot a lot more and, and be more productive in, uh, in those type of situations. Uh, that's interesting, and, and I'm going to touch on, on Culver a bit later. Um, but when you had spoken about you know not having a, a, a solid mid-range game, one of the things that I saw that RJ was working on this summer was uh, you know getting around defenders and, and getting that, that first step, improving in those areas. Do you think that's somewhere that he could potentially struggle at the next level? Uh, yeah, you know, I, I think uh... – what stands out to me is he's he's really effective, like I said, going to his, his strong hand to his left, but uh, he has a long way to go uh, with the right, you know, and in the NBA, I, I think there's, uh, you know, there's not too many guys who can only go one way, and if you if you are one of those guys, you know, like Kelly Oubre is a guy who I've worked with, uh, I've worked with in D.C., and, you know, he can pretty much only drive left, and, uh, you know, if teams can play you like that, it becomes a lot harder to, to be a productive bl- player, so... You know, you see even guys like Harden, obviously teams in the playoffs, uh, you know, broke out a really exaggerated defense, forcing him right. But he's still, you know, he's elite going either way. The right was just kind of a, a slightly lesser of two evils. You know, he's a slightly worse passer maybe going that way. But he can do almost everything, you know, going in both directions. I think RJ right now, like I said, is is pretty good going to his left and, and pretty weak going to the right. So I, I would hope and think that they're doing a lot of uh, – weekend development with him and and getting him more comfortable you know driving to his right using his right hand passing with his right hand uh etc defense that that's one of the things that uh that this fan base obviously that's our bread and butter that's our calling card and we're still hoping that that we see some improvements from coach Fisdale and his staff and and out of the players you know hoping that he can get the most out of them how do you see rj kind of fitting in defensively uh on this team I think he's a I think he's a high upside defender. I think he has a really good basketball IQ. Uh, I think he's you know is a good help defender. I think he is in the right spots. And uh, you know, watching him on defense, you, you really saw a lot of just awareness. And uh, you know, like him and Reddish both, I think have the potential to be really good defenders. But I think right now, what stood out to me, at least on film, was that uh, you know Reddish was uh, a little less disciplined in the right spots less. Uh, I think RJ, you know, knew, knew exactly what his job was, understood the rotations, um, you know, understood help side positioning. So I, I think for sure, I think he could fit in, you know, right away. I, it's hard for any rookie to, to be in, you know, the conversation for an all defensive team or to be really elite on that end. So I wouldn't put that kind of pressure on him, but I think absolutely he could be a, you know, a solid defensive uh, starter and uh, you know, a guy who, would do fine most nights against the, you know, most of the guys he's matched up with. Yeah. And I think that's, that's one of the things that concern us, you know, just hearing the fans reaction and and opinions from this draft pick is how he would fit with Kevin Knox on it from a defensive standpoint. I know you had, um, you know, gave some opinions to Ian Begley on on how they would uh, fit in terms of um, offense, but from a defensive standpoint, can you see them coexisting? I can, you know, I I think, uh, you know, it's not perfect, but I think they both can play kind of the two, three spot in the NBA is is pretty interchangeable uh, to me today. Um, You know, I think Barrett is a little more equipped to to guard, you know, the the twos, the guys that sometimes have a little more wiggle, a little more ball handling uh, capability. You know, he plays a little bit lower to the ground, um, you know, whereas Knox is a little, a little more upright and more, 
you know, maybe to face the the Otto Porter type threes, um, you know, the guys that have a little more size sometimes. But, uh, yeah, I don't really see a reason. Like I said, I, I think in the NBA there's so much switching anyway. And if, if you're at the 2-3 the two, three, two, three spot, there's usually, you know, a lot of overlap between those. And, it, you know, if both of them buy in and, and compete hard and play, you know, play all out every night, I think the pairing should work fine. It'll just ultimately be up to them to, to do it. How about offensively? How do you see them gelling? I, I think it, you know, I think it works fine. I think, again, just the question comes down to, you know, how high are each of their ceilings? I, I think, like I said, RJ compliments Knox fine because, you know, he, he has the ability to play with the ball in his hands a lot more. I think that's something, you know, Knox is going to be more of a, of a spot up guy, a, a one or two dribble guy, you know, a guy who's mostly just, you know, an off the ball uh, type, of, you know, who, takes as few dribbles as possible to, to just get his open looks. And I think Barrett's going to be a guy who does a lot of the probing, a lot of handling in the pick and roll and so on and so forth. So I, I think they should, uh, you know, be able to play off each other pretty well. And, uh, you know, schematically, I think it's just on Fisdale to, uh, you know, run some good sets to get Knox uh, some shots to put RJ in some pick and rolls. And uh, I, I think, you know, it'll work fine. It's not going to be one of the best pairings in the NBA. Right you know, until they all both really reach their potential. But uh, I see no reason why they shouldn't be able to play together. And and hopefully we see, you know, some of that high motor, that high intensity kind of rub off on Knox. I know that was kind of a knock on him coming into the season. You know, he had some up and down times where his energy was kind of, you know, wavering at, at times. Sometimes you would just see him kind of hiding off in, in the corner and not really getting involved. But then you, on the flip side, when you did see him get involved, you, you saw everything go up. His rebounding numbers went up. Um, his free throw attempts went up. I, I thought he finished the year well. But it certainly had his struggles. I mean, what what were your opinions on Kevin Knox last season? Yeah, you know, uh, one of the main things you have to learn as a rookie or as a young player in the NBA is just that there there can't be any off switch. You know, so some people think that just you know when the playoffs becomes so much harder that you can kind of preserve your energy until then. But you know, I, I've been around enough NBA coaches and players to know that like when you're on the floor in a game, there every single possession you have to be going absolutely all out so you know what kevin knox thought was all out and maybe what was all out for him in high school and at kentucky is is different than you know what's all out in the end at the nba level so i think uh you know he seems like a good kid he seems like he he gets it and and i agree with you he improved as the season went on and and shows a lot of flashes and a lot of potential but uh yeah i think defense for the most part is is playing hard and uh you know hustling being in the right spots just going all out and uh you know once you once you got that part down you're, you're in pretty good shape so i think uh you know like you said if, if rj and the culture you know gets him to play with a more consistent motor uh this season then he should be perfectly fine and how about Dennis Smith Jr.? You know, he's another one of those uh, enigma type prospects that we have right now. Future's still unclear, but I, st- I still think once a free agency smoke clears, I think DSJ will still be here with his team. Another guy who showed flashes last year, he's on a second team in as many years. How do you see those two gelling, especially when neither one uh, shot the ball particularly efficient? Lee, um, in, in their previous years. How do you see those two coexisting in the backcourt? Yeah, I, uh, yeah, he, he is an enigma for sure. I mean, I think, uh, you know, he's, he's enormously talented, uh, for sure, but I, I think he kind of has suffered from that same problem at times that, uh, I think the 82 game seasons been a little long for him and, uh, you know, hard to, to adjust to and, and commit, mentally uh to being there you know all the time and doing the things you have to do to you know to be an every night player in the nba um i I think like i said the the body the athleticism the the skill set you know all those things are there it's just uh, a matter of getting over the hump and and translating it to a you know a spot where you can play 35 to 40 minutes a night and, and be effective almost every night so yeah i mean i i think uh you know they just have so many kids who are uh you know, huge potential. And I think it's a shame that so many people have kind of written uh, Dennis off because I think, for example, if he was, if he was in this year's draft class, even, you know, having his two years in the league, I think he'd be a, a top five, to 10 pick in the draft. I think that's the, 
that's still the kind of talent he has. And it's just a, a matter of, you know, really harnessing it and, and getting him to buy in every night. So, yeah, I hope he is still there. And I, I think he does have uh, a lot of potential. But, you know, it'll be interesting to see how it shakes out. And, uh, you know, if a Kemba or, or somebody else comes, then obviously he's kind of out of minutes or at best a, a backup again. And, you know, then it's going to be on him to to really keep his focus and uh, not lose sight of his development. Yeah, and, and that, that's one of the areas I, I hope he kind of improves is definitely his dedication, his body. You know, the back injury was certainly a concern at such a young age, you know, to have that type of injury. But I do hope, you know, once we talk about free agency later on, I do hope that they bring in uh, um, a veteran point guard who can really mentor him on, on being a pro and running an offense and hopefully somebody that can, can have a long-lasting effect on him. Yeah, uh, you you can't really you just can't win in the NBA without uh, without vets. You know that's it's a it's a cliche, but it's uh, but it's true. You know I think the Knicks Fizdale did a good job. I think last season, you know, developing a lot of uh, role players and you know you know the cap situation better than me, so you'll have mm-hmm. to remind me. You know who's definitely back and who's out next season and so on. But you know I think between the uh, Vonle and Cornet and uh, you know Dotson and uh, Alonzo, you know, I think they, they have a lot of guys who could fit into a, a rotation and who we got, you know, playing hard for the most part and, uh, you know, guys that can be that, you know, sixth to ninth piece. I, I think they kind of have that in spades, but it's just uh, now you have to get, you know, you have to get a couple superstars to, to really build around and, uh, you know, that's the next level for them. And, and you know, I, I was debating with someone on, on Twitter about this, and they said, you know, having a veteran presence is overrated. But from, from your experience, you know, you've worked for NBA teams, you've been around the locker rooms and seen guys' progression. You believe in that. You believe that it, that having that veteran presence can really help these young guys develop. Oh, for sure. Yeah, there, there's no question. I mean, there's – yeah, you know, there, like I said, there's a big difference, uh, you know, between – competing to, to win 20 games and competing to win 40 games, you know, win, winning in the NBA is, is really, really hard. And so many people take it for granted. And, uh, you know, I was around in DC for, for pretty much exactly that. You know, I was around in DC when we had Andre Blotch and, and JaVale McGee oh, yeah. and Nick Young. And, you know, my first experience in the NBA was, uh, seeing them walk in at halftime down 20 laughing about it, you know, and we were winning 20, 25 games every year. And, you know, I was a guy who I worked for Gary Williams in college and he'd be losing his mind if we were only up 50 in a game, mm. you know. So mm-hmm. it was uh, it was a quite the culture shock. But, uh, you know, once we got some we got Trevor Reza, we got uh, Nene, you know, once we put some some of the right veterans on the team that really helped uh, change the culture. And, you know, we were able to eventually work our way up to, to winning 49 games, you know, my last season there. So. Yeah, I think for the Knicks, it's definitely, uh, you know, about now finding the, the right veterans and the right stars to, uh, to put on that team. And, uh, you know, obviously that's a, a recruiting issue as well. And uh, we'll see how they do. Back back to R.J. Barrett. You know, these guys are, always are debating, you know, floor, ceiling and whatnot. What, what would you say would be his ceiling and floor in terms of NBA comparison? Yeah, like I said, uh, you know, the guy, the guy like Ingles uh, comes Ingles. to mind, uh, you know, a more slightly more athletic version, obviously. But I, I think people, you know, Joe's a guy who's made himself into a, a player that's making, you know, 11 or 12 million a year. And I think most people think he should have got 15 or more. Um, you know, he's a he's a starter. He's a elite shooter. Obviously, he's a playmaking uh, pick and roll guard. You know, he's a he's a really good player in the league. So. I think a guy like that comes to mind. I think Rodney Hood, you know, what he's made himself into, um, you know, I know he's been kind of up and down and inconsistent in the league, but uh, I think kind of for Portland last season, he showed uh, flashes of, of getting his getting his swag back and, uh, you know, showing why he was a guy that was thought of with, with pretty high upside. So, yeah, you know, I think those are the two mostly. But, uh, you know, there's so many 3 and D wings in the league today that uh, – you know, if you can if you can play that role well and, and make shots and play defense, you know, you're you're automatically a pretty darn good player. But uh, I do think what RJ has in addition, you know, is a little bit in that Batum kind of mold of, uh, like I said, being able to handle the ball and uh, make plays for his teammates as well, I think is something you can't really teach as much. And I think uh, he can bring that to the table. And you had mentioned Jared Colvin. It was interesting. I only saw very limited 
um, games from Jared Culver. I saw the the conference tournaments and and through the NCAA tournament, and his game reminded me. I don't and I don't know if you agree now. His game kind of reminded me of Josh Howard. You know, yeah. I, I saw a guy like you said that can score on, on many different levels. Not the most athletic guy, but very smart, high IQ player. Um, gets in the right spots. Just a, just a very smart player, and and he really led that Texas Tech team. You know, who was a solid defensive team, but not known for as much offense. And and I think he really carried them when they needed him uh, up until that that championship game. And we saw Hunter kind of outshine them in that second half, but I thought Culver was a hell of a prospect. But you you were saying that you would take him over RJ. Yeah, I uh, I don't know. There's just something, I, you know, I, I wrote it in my scout about Culver. I kind of just said it was uh, sort of an eye test type thing, and I, I couldn't exactly put a finger on it, but it kind of just one of those, you know, you know when you see a type hunches, and that's, mm. you know, there's certainly no guarantee, and I'm betting far from 100% and everybody else, I, you know, nobody's close to that. Um, but, you know, all we can do is project. Uh, and like I said, what, what I do see in him is is the ability that uh, that RJ doesn't have just in terms of being able to, to play in the mid-range, to play with his back to the basket a little more, to uh, to create his own shot down there, you know, and that's a skill set that, that Paul George has, that, mm. that Kawhi has, you know, and I think uh, most of the, the really elite scorers in the league, you know, like I've said, they, they can score from all three levels. Um, so I think that's why, you know, Culver with his size, I, I know he's listed at like six seven, six eight, but I, I've seen some theories and some people that seem to really believe he's he's grown even and is yeah. closer to like six nine. And, uh, you know, I think he, he's pretty long. He's obviously pretty strong, uh, you know, a really capable switchable defender and yeah so watching him you know george paul george was really the guy that came to mind and uh you know he even shoot an incredible percentage kind of like rj from three uh this season but i think the potential is there and you know Kawhi even shot what 29 percent or something from three in college so ultimately it's just about how hard these guys work and uh you know get with the right shooting coaches and so on but uh yeah i think culver has a chance to be a great player uh, in Minnesota. And, uh, you know, I, I personally said I think, you know, he could end up being the best or second best player uh, in the draft class. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, we'll, we'll see, man. And like you said, it's it's so early to tell. But I, I certainly liked uh, what I had saw from Culver this this college season, this past college season. You, you had mentioned um, just, you know, how, how you break down – film and and how you evaluate players from a scouting perspective clearly you are watching the games from a different lens than the average fan or you know the the casual fan so what are some of the things that you look at when you're breaking down game tapes on certain guys yeah i think it's uh you know it's just really a matter of you know knowing what uh what they're being asked to do first of all um you know and i think for that you really just have to understand uh, the schemes, you know, and understand, okay, if, if they're playing, you know, if they're playing drop coverage on a pick and roll, um, you know, is, is the guard doing his best to, to fight over the screen and keep chasing the ball handler and, you know, are the guys who can be giving help from the weak side, are they in the right spots? You know, it, everything is kind of contextual, um, you know, so when I try to watch these draft prospects, for example, I'll, I'll kind of... Uh, you know, just really, really hone in on them. I'll watch, you know, three to four full games of, of Duke, of Texas Tech, um, you know, playing against high-level uh, op- uh, opponents. I don't really care about them playing a bunch of games against uh, Appalachian State, right. you know. Like, <laughs> th- those yeah. games are just not, to be honest, indicative of anything that's going to translate to the NBA because it's just, you know, it's not even the same ballpark mm-hmm. uh, athletically. So I think you have to find, you know s- – obviously high level competition games. And then, yeah, like I said, I pretty much just watch RJ watch if he's in the right spots every single time, if he's in a stance every single time, if he, you know, uh, runs the floor the right way, if he's in the right spots, you know, um, just kind of how he plays offensively, what his role is, all those things. And, you know, there's, there's a thousand things that can be evaluated probably in, in every single basketball game. And, you know, like I said, at the end of the day, we're, we're all just projecting, but yeah, what I just try to bring to it is just, you know, trying to have an understanding of what skills, uh, you know, translate to the NBA, what you have to be able to do to, to be an elite player. 
in the NBA. And, you know, RJ, like I said, checks a lot of those boxes for me and, and has a lot of special abilities. But, uh, you know, there are real flaws like the lack of right hand, the lack of mid range, things like that, that, uh, you know, are why he wasn't my second or third best player. But, uh, you know, I think he's perfectly fine right there in the top five. And I think the Knicks still got a really good piece. And uh, now, like I said, it's ultimately up to him. It's up to them and uh, up to the development. What would you say is the toughest adjustment that one of these, you know, let's say these these top prospects, a lottery pick, what would you say is the toughest adjustment from college to the NBA that a prospect has to make? Uh, probably just, you know, the, uh, the sheer length of it, of the season, um, you know, 82 games is, is a monster. Uh, you know, you, you think in college that you, you, you know, you really had a grind and you played 30 something games in the tournament and, you know, you played two or three games a week, but now it's going to be sometimes four, sometimes five games a week. And, uh, you know, just a relentless, relentless schedule for, for like seven months. So, you know, it's just really a matter of, like I said, pushing through that kind of the rookie wall that, that everybody seems to hit at some point and, you know, understanding that, uh, you know, I think it was kind of phrased to me like the best players in the league will play 72 games, meaning, you know, they might dress for all 82, but out of those 82, they might have like 10 just clunkers where they're just not really there, just not really into it mentally, you know, and you watch rookies sometimes out of those 82, they're, they're playing hard maybe for 40 to 50 of them, so... You know, it's just a, it's a big adjustment to, to get to that level and to, to be one of those guys that, you know, can play for play at a really high level for 70 games. And uh, I think that's that's the biggest mental challenge and physical challenge as well, obviously. Who were some prospects or prospect that you were not wrong on, but who were some prospects that surprised you where you were looking at tape on them and, and either they weren't, you know, meeting the expectations and and they came into the league and, and really um, excelled or, you know, guys that looked like gangbusters on film that came into the NBA and just never translated. Uh, yeah. You know, there's, um, I think for example, Damian Lillard was a guy that I probably was, you know, I slept on for sure mm-hmm. when, when we did his draft film and just looking at him play. And I, I think, uh, you know, you see him, dominating at uh weber state oh, and it's, it's hard sometimes player, to huh yeah, i said that's one of my favorite players right now man oh uh, yeah yeah no he's unbelievable but uh yeah you know like he he was a four-year player in college and we thought oh you know how much is this going to translate but yeah really he surprised everybody i think and then i'll say like the next year after him uh cj mccollum was a guy actually that i was really high on and that i was you know he ended up going i think 10th and uh you know, watching him, his skill set just reminded me so much of Dame and, and mm-hmm. you know, that same mid-major ability at uh, at Lehigh. I thought he just was, you know, a, a God-given uh, scorer, just an unbelievable shooter who could, who could do it pretty much from any spot on the floor. And, uh, you know, that's translated pretty well. So, yeah, I mean, we all have so many hits and misses. Yeah. I, I was I was really low on Kendall Marshall, and he ended up busting uh, – I was probably pretty high on Andrew Wiggins, and so far he looks Ugh. like a boss. Oh, you know? yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> Disappointment, man. I had a lot of high hopes for Wiggins, too, man. But now it looks like Minnesota wants to get rid of him any chance they can get. I'm sure they're regretting giving him that contract. Yeah, it's, it's again, it's, it's it's the motor thing, you know. It's like when he brings it, when he when he wants to do it every night, he's yeah. he's pretty great. But it's just uh, it's not consistent enough. Not at all, and and you mentioned CJ. I you know I, I hope Portland with the West being wide open. I hope they can they can take it. I I just love that backcourt so much, man. And CJ took such a leap in the playoffs. It really carried that team in, in certain stretches when Dame didn't have it. Um, you know I, I hope those guys can can really seize the moment with the, with the Golden State dynasty kind of taking a break. Yeah, it, it was awesome to see them. Uh, you know, get to the conference finals, and like I I said. Uh, Somebody with their coaching staff had texted me when uh, when Nurkic uh, got hurt and said, uh, you know, effectively our season ended tonight, you know, and then they end up uh, going to the conference finals. I, I think it's a really gritty team uh, with a lot of heart. And, uh, you know, if somehow they can find a way to, you know, get another that, that three, four kind of wing spot seems to be the, the one glaring issue yeah. almost every season with them. But, uh, yeah, I, I do love that team. And I think 
with Nurkic back healthy, they, they should be one of the best in the West for sure. Absolutely, man. You know, Brian, I definitely appreciate you spending some time and, and really breaking down uh, some of RJ's game. I think it's really cool when we have guys who do this for a living, you know, and like I said, you know, you, you certainly approach the game and view the game from a different lens. So it's great. You know, like I said, the fan base is really uh, optimistic about this kid and, and they're they're hoping to learn everything they can about him. So I definitely appreciate you giving us a lot of time and, and hopefully over the course of the season, uh, you, you would come back on and, and share some more breakdowns with us. Where where can uh, the, the fans find you? Uh, yeah, just uh, on Twitter, Scout with Brian. Uh, Brian is with a Y. Uh, scoutwithbrian.com has all my content to date. And uh, on, on that, on the YouTube channel, they can that's where they can see the the RJ film breakdown, the Culver film bre- uh, breakdown, all the all the free agency stuff, all the draft stuff I've done. Um, and yeah, really, really appreciate you having me and uh, hope I can come back sometime. Absolutely, man. Brian O'Ringer, thanks again, man. I really appreciate it. Thank you.